What is it about a person that makes them really stand out in history as somebody who left the world a different place than when they came? Not just famous, not just somebody that everybody knows about, but somebody who's significant, who really leaves an imprint. There are a couple of authors in the last few years who set out to discover that through data. They, they set up a bunch of algorithms and poured a bunch of information and data points into a computer and sought to figure out who are the most significant people who've ever lived. And a great example of this is President Chester Arthur. Did you know we had a former president named Chester Arthur? Probably not. He's probably the least well-known, the least memorable president in United States history. He succeeded uh, President Garfield after President Garfield was assassinated, was never, I don't think, was ever officially elected as president And he's often seen as one of the least memorable presidents in our nation's history. But yet, through their computations, they found that he's the 499th most significant person to ever live. Uh, Justin Bieber, by the way, is somewhere in the 8,000s. Put this in perspective. Justin Bieber is way more popular, way more famous than Chester Arthur. Most of you might be wondering, I'm still not sure if Chester Arthur was ever actually president. But yet, because he was president of the United States, there's a significance that comes with his life that exceeds most people. He's the least significant president of the United States, according to their list. But they, they look to see who has really changed the world, whether or not people know who they were, who has really made an impact on the world. And through their computations and algorithms, they discover that their 10 most significant people to ever live are people like Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln and George Washington, Adolf Hitler, Aristotle, uh, Napoleon, William Shakespeare, and number one on the list, Jesus of Nazareth totally objective measurements, just looking at the pure impact of this life. What is it about this man, Jesus of Nazareth, that though he did not have an earthly throne to sit on, though he did not have wealth and power to influence people, what is it about this penniless preacher that after all these years that people like Shakespeare and Aristotle and and Lincoln and Washington and Hitler come along and yet at the end of the day when we're settling the score, we still say this man, Jesus of Nazareth, that's the most important person who ever lived. Non-believers saying this is still the most significant person who ever lived. What is it about this man that makes him so absolutely unforgettable? My name is Steve Dunmire. I'm one of the pastors here at Victory. So glad you're here with us this morning. I want to welcome you. If you're, this is your first time with us, we're so glad you're here with us this morning. Welcome those of you who are online. Thanks for joining us this morning as well. Whatever day of the week you're joining us online. And uh, it's a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. So glad you're here with us this morning. And we're going to continue our series, Foundational Questions, where we're looking this summer at 10 really shaking, uh, shaping questions that are important for us to, to grapple with. And the first week we talked about why are we here? Why is there life on earth? this place of all the other places. And the second week, uh, Sydney talked about this question of how do we get reconciled with God and did a great job at that. And then last week, Angie talked about why do we do good works. And of course, we do good works, as she said, because we are, we're helping heaven invade earth when we do good, earths, uh, good works on earth. Not to earn God's favor, but as an expression of the work that God has done in our life. And this morning, we're going to ask this question, why Jesus? Or maybe even another way, what is it that makes Jesus so unforgettable, so undeniably significant? In addition this morning, I do want to welcome back our students from NTS camp. We had, I think, 49 students from Victory at NTS camp this week. Just an incredible group. And I heard from the camp director that they had over, I think it was over 120 students make commitments to Christ at Never the Same camp this week, which is just phenomenal. A truly... A truly great week. They left last Sunday to go to Houghton College, came back on Thursday from Houghton University, so that's a little disorienting. Houghton Houghton College became Houghton University, according to the New York State Board of Regents this week, and so they got to be there for that. Not even Houghton is the same after that week, and our students are coming back never the same as well. Uh, Throughout the rest of the series, we're going to be looking at questions like, are we in the end times? What does the Bible say about human sexuality? Can a leopard change his spots? And I just want you to know as we go through this series, uh, I'm aware of little ears in the room. So as you're maybe thinking about some of those topics we might be addressing, I'm going to be aware, make sure that our topics are PG for the sake of little ears that may or may not be in the room at, this, at, at those times. And I'm really excited about this series throughout the summer. But this morning, and as we address this question of why Jesus, what makes him so significant, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse 13. Let me pray for us as we jump into the Word this morning. God, we thank you for this place and this privilege of joining together with brothers and sisters and for the, the work that you did at Never the Same Camp this week, for the ways that uh, 
uh, big and small ways that we've been able to bless our community throughout the week. And now as we open up your word, speak to us. We want to hear you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 16, beginning verse 13 says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And Jesus is beginning here right away by asking this question, What do people say about me? And there's actually three groups that we can kind of see their impression of Jesus, uh, both said explicitly and kind of implied here. And the first is actually Jesus himself. Notice he doesn't ask the question, what do people say about me? He says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And that phrase is significant. This first question is, uh, what did Jesus say about himself? And Jesus referred to himself, his, his phrase of choice was this term, Son of Man. We most often call Jesus the Son of God, and he is the Son of God. Some other places we see Jesus referred to as the Son of David, because he came down through the lineage of King David, which is really significant. For the, for the reign of God on earth, and the Messiah was going to come down through the, through the line of David. But Jesus chose this word, Son of Man, over and over again as a way of referring to who, he, to who he is. That phrase, Son of Man, actually appears 90 times in the book of Ezekiel, and it even appears in the book of Daniel. And it is this phrase steeped in prophetic tradition, and it, it implies that this person is a servant, that it's a suffering servant, that this is someone who's going to rule with justice and power and authority one day. And Jesus continually refers to himself as the Son of Man, a phrase that we don't often use to describe Jesus, but it's how he referred to himself. So that's the first group. Second group is, what do the people say about Jesus? And this is the question here. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And the disciples say, well, some think you might be Jeremiah, brought back from the dead. Some people think you might be Elijah, brought back from the dead. Some people think you might even be the most recent prophet we've had, uh, John the Baptist, who was just beheaded by, by Herod. Some people think you might be him walking around here. But there's a clear consensus that Jesus is a prophet. He is not just another rabbi, that there's something prophetic about Jesus. And almost like he represents all their favorite prophets of, eight, of days past. And so the consensus on the street is Jesus is a prophet. There's something unique about him. And that's the truth. That's what people said about Jesus. It's just not the whole story. We know that there are a lot of other things that people said about Jesus. And so this is the third group. What have other people said about Jesus? Well, we know that Jesus' opponents, his critics, called him a son of Beelzebul. They, they called him, the, the religious leaders of the day accused him of being a Sabbath breaker and, and complained that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors. They didn't like the, the crowd that he ran with. Even when he was crucified, the, the guards there mockingly called him a Messiah and a prophet. And on the cross, as his arms were spread wide, Pilate had put above his head there the words, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And that was listed in Aramaic and Latin and Greek there as a way of, of kind of taunting Jesus and, and taunting his followers. But the religious leaders were upset about it. They said, can you please amend that, please edit that, that he's not actually the King of the Jews, but that he claimed to be the King of the Jews. And Pilate said, I've written what I've written, let it be what it is. And it ended up kind of being unintentionally prophetic about Jesus and really proclaiming who he was there as he was raised up in glory. We know that his followers called him rabbi. We know that they called him Lord and Master. We know that in Matthew chapter 9, there are some blind men who are following after Jesus, asking him to heal them, and they called him Son of David. So there's all these terms floating around there about Jesus we see from the biblical text. Today, 75% of Americans believe that Jesus was an actual historical person. That means that 25% of Americans believe that Jesus was not an actual literal person, but a, kind of a mythical figure. And today in America, about 52% of Americans believe that Jesus was a good moral teacher and nothing more. Majority of your neighbors, a majority of the people you go to work with, believe that Jesus is nothing more than a good moral teacher along the lines of Gandhi or Dr. King or, or, or Aristotle or one of these philosophers, just a good moral teacher. Muslims believe that Jesus was a prophet. Buddhists believe that Jesus was enlightened. Uh, Hindus believe that he, Jesus may have been a lowercase God, that he was definitely a holy man and a wise teacher. Jews believe that Jesus was a false messiah. And there's all these opinions about, out there about Jesus. And Jesus is kind of combing, doing a survey of, the, of society. Wh who do people say that the Son of Man is? And now he asks this follow-up question, verse 15. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. 
Jesus' reputation is growing at this stage in his ministry, and word is getting out there about Jesus, and there's all these opinions circulating about Jesus. And fame, fame and celebrity is a unique burden to bear. Reminds me of a story about Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite was the anchorman for CBS Evening News for almost 20 years, and probably at that time one of the most respected and trusted people in America. And I believe it was in his retirement years, he and his wife Betsy used to love to go sailing. And one, one day they were sailing off Martha's Vineyard, and they'd run out of supplies on the boat, and so they docked the boat, went ashore, and were going into a store to get supplies. And the burden of being married to Walter Cronkite was that everybody recognized him wherever you went, and everybody wanted to ask him questions. And so they're in this store, and people are asking him, oh, Mr. Cronkite, I saw your interview with so-and-so. Are they a nice, as nice and real person as they are on TV? Oh, yes, they're a wonderful person. And Mr. Cronkite, have you ever met so-and-so? Oh, yep, I've met them. And have you, have, do you know so-and-so? Nope, I haven't met that person yet, but we've got an interview hopefully, hopefully in the next few years. And this is going on as they're trying just to make their way through the store to get eggs and bread and milk and all the, all the essentials. And finally, they get up to the counter and they're paying for their supplies. And Betsy Cronkite is relieved that they're going to be able to finally get out of here, get back on the boat and get some peace and quiet. And just as they pay for their supplies and they turn, a man steps out in front of Walter Cronkite and says, Mr. Cronkite, do you know so-and-so? Mr. Cronkite took a deep breath, and he's, he's a tall man, and this booming voice, and he said, well, I can't say that I know him, but I've met him, and he seems like a good fellow. He steps around him, and they walk out of the store, and Betsy Cronkite turns to Walter and says, Walter, we have to do something about your hearing. He said, what do you mean? He said, that man asks you if you know Jesus. That, that, I expected a better laugh out of that, to be honest. <laughs> I, can't say I, met him. I can't say I know him, but I've met him. He seems like a good fellow. Peter, Peter says, I know who you are. I know what everybody says about you. I know the rumors out there about you. I've heard the rumors that you're John the Baptist come back from the dead to haunt Herod. I hear the rumors about who you are. I hear what the critics say about you, and I know where they're wrong. I hear what your critics say about you, and I know what motivates their jealousy. I know who you are. You're the Christ. And this word that Peter uses here is the word that's translated in Hebrew as Messiah. It's translated in Greek as Christ. It's translated in English as anointed. And this comes from this long tradition of anointing somebody with oil for a special task. And there's this sense that that Peter and the disciples have that Jesus is anointed by God for this unique task, for this unique moment, that when Jesus is in the room, that there's holiness in the room. That when Jesus is in the room, that somehow God is here. That there's a unique thing that's happening in this unique person. And when we look back at all the people in Scripture and all the people in history, this man, this man is unique. He stands out. He's anointed. This is the Christ. This is the Messiah. This is a tipping point in history. And Peter says, I know who you are. You are an extraordinary person. And it's not even fair to put you in a list of other people. It's not even fair to compare other people to you. You are the anointed one of God. You are the Christ. And here's what Jesus says in reply to him in verse 17. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. Jesus says this, this, you are a rock. He, He renames Simon as Peter. Petros, Peter, which is kind of like the modern name Rocky, if anybody even names anybody Rocky anymore. And he renames him Peter, Rock, that this is a solid foundation. And the foundation is this proclamation that Jesus is unique, that Jesus is the anointed, the the one of God, who is the Messiah, who is the Christ. And he gives him this new name. And ever since this time, Jesus has been building his church and kingdoms come and kingdoms go. Kings rise and kings fall. Emperors rise and emperors fall. And Jesus' word stays and endures. Jesus continues to move throughout history and his movement continues to spread. And when we look at all the different ways that Jesus is uniquely significant, I can share just three really simple examples of, of things that we would take for granted that are completely countercultural because of things that Jesus brought about. And the first is the example of widows. In the first century Roman world, widows were, were viewed as an inconvenience. Widows were actually taxed at a higher rate than the general population as a punishment for outliving their husbands. Absolutely unthinkable. And so to be a widow in the first century world was to live an incredibly difficult, it's, it's a difficult life in the 21st century world. It was especially difficult in the first century world. 
But the followers of Jesus remembered that when Jesus was on the cross, arms spread wide, bleeding and dying, he saw his mother and his disciple John, and he said, John, look after her. Mom, he's going to take care of you from now on. And the church remembered that. And remembered that, and that in the Old Testament, one of the values that God continued to drive home to his people was that we have an obligation to care for orphans and widows. And that had been reserved for the Jewish community. But through Jesus, that spread around the world so that Christians from a very early age, from the, from the first centuries, from the first few waves of the church that spread out from Jesus, they were known for taking in widows who were not related to them. Widows who found themselves in need and they would take them in and take their care upon themselves in ways that was totally countercultural. This is a part of the impact of Jesus. And on this rock, he continues to build this church. Second example I'll share is about the sanctity of life. First century Roman world, infanticide was widespread. Uh, through archaeological digs, the, we continue to find mass graves of, of newborns and infants. In the first century world, a child was not considered a real person, a full person, until they were a couple years old. And, and, and a newborn baby was considered a choice for the parents. They were under no legal obligation to raise that child. And often, newborn babies who were not wanted would be left on a dung heap and die from exposure. Also in the first century world, it was totally unheard of for a rabbi to use a child as an example in their teaching or to, to use a child as a role model in their teaching. It was completely unheard of. And along comes Jesus who says, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you've got to be like a child. Along comes Jesus who when, when parents are bringing their children to Jesus to, to bless them, the disciples are, are pushing them away, encouraging them to go away. And he says, no, 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 let the little children come to me. And the early church remembered that. And they began to go to those dung heaps and rescue the, the children who were left to die of exposure. And, and they began to, to fight for life and fight for the sanctity of life. And to this day, this movement continues to spread where Christians have recognized that every life is precious, that every child is born in the image of God. And we not only say that life begins at birth, we say that life begins at conception and that life is precious. And this begins with the movement of Jesus. It was totally countercultural in the first century. This is, and on this rock, Jesus continues to build his church. Last example I'll share with you has to do with the sick. There's an epidemic in, in the year 80, 165, second century. About a third to a quarter of the population was dying from smallpox. Incredibly dangerous, incredibly high death rate. And people, when they got sick with smallpox, were left to die on their own, except that the Christians wouldn't stay away. And the Christians began, remembered what Jesus has said, that whatever you've done for the least of these, it's as though you've done it for me. You helped me when I was in prison. You helped me when I was sick. You helped me when I was naked. And the Christians began to go towards those people who were dying of smallpox, and they took care of them. And one man, Rodney Stark, says that one of the reasons behind the early spread of the church was that they cared for the sick, and they cared for the dying, and people saw this extravagant love on display and were so moved by this that they wanted to be part of this group who would take care of them when they were sick and dying. Dionysus, who is the bishop of Alexandria at this time, says, Heedless of the danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need, ministering to them in Christ. And when, then when they died, he says, when they ended up dying of smallpox, they died happy, knowing that they had followed the example of Jesus. A man, man named Dr. Mark Wilson from Westmont College says, If you ask what is Jesus' influence on medicine and, in, and compassion, I would suggest that wherever you have an institution of self-giving for the lonely, schools, hospitals, hospitals, hospices, orphanages, for those who will never be able to repay, this probably has its roots in the movement of Jesus. This, the ripple effects of Jesus coming into this world are way beyond what we can ever imagine. We, we picture the movement of Jesus and the, the impact of Jesus being churches and steeples and chapels and cathedrals. The impact of Jesus coming is hospitals and homeless shelters and orphanages and adoption centers. The, the impact of Jesus is, is, if we try to pull out the impact Jesus has had on society, no sector of society would not be impacted. Jesus says his name has been plowed into culture. Empires have come and empires have gone. Kingdoms have come and kingdoms have gone. And yet we see that Jesus is this unique person who has so changed the world that it's impossible to imagine what the world would be like without him. Why Jesus? We believe that Jesus was born of a virgin in Bethlehem. Her name was Mary. He was thought to be the son of Joseph. He lived in Nazareth. He grew up there. He was a carpenter. He gathered a group of 12 disciples around him, hapless and bumbling, 
never really getting it. He was crucified on a Roman cross, suffered under Pontius Pilate, died, rose again on the third day unexpectedly from Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, ascended to the right hand of the Father where he sits now and from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And there has never been anyone like Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And there has never been anyone like Jesus. And here's one of the reasons why this matters for us. There's a lot. It matters for all of us in a multitude of ways. J.I. Packer and John Stott say that one of the reasons why we, when you look out at the church landscape, the Christian landscape today, is that there are a lot of miniature Christians. There are a lot of shrunken down Christians. And they say the reason is, is because we've been looking at God through the reverse end of the telescope. You know how with a telescope, if you, if you look at it the proper way, it makes everything bigger. And if you look at the reverse way, it makes everything smaller. They say it's like we've been looking at God through the reverse end of a telescope. And they say what we really need, what the church in the 21st century needs, is to look at the full size Jesus in his full dimensions, in his full capacity. To see the full, full color Jesus in living color, in full dynamics, not the shrunken down version of Jesus, but the full, radical, unexpected, significant Jesus who has changed culture for 2,000 years. And I want to share with you three ways that you can begin to peel back the layers and perhaps see Jesus in his full dimensions. And the first is really simple. Read the Gospels. Read the Gospels. G.K. Chesterton says that for years he just heard people talk about Jesus. He said, to hear people talk about Jesus, he sounds so serene and simple and his hands are folded and his hair is parted in the middle. He doesn't disrupt anything. He said, when I turned to the pages of the New Testament and I saw the Jesus that is described in the Gospels, I, he's, I love this quote. He says, I found a man of extraordinary being with lips of thunder and acts of lurid decision flinging down tables and casting out devils. He said, people talk about Jesus as if he was always so calm and timid and simple and placid. But to read what he actually said, he is disrupting everybody. To, to have a conversation with Jesus was to have your world turned upside down. Philip Yancey said two words that no one could ever use to describe Jesus in the New Testament is predictable and boring. So go to the Gospels. Read the Jesus who appears in the Gospels and soak up the full dimensions of Jesus. The second is the second way to experience the, the Jesus as he really appears to us is that to follow the advice that he gave us. And he said, if you want to see me, serve the sick, serve the homeless, serve the naked, serve the hungry. And often, we go looking for the face of Jesus in the, in the face of the needy, and there we see him in full dimension. Somehow, I can't explain it. I don't know how it works. But when you do those things, when you serve the least and the lost, the presence of Jesus shows up in a way that's Powerful and significant. So follow his advice there. The third way I'd say is maybe today you would say, it's time for me to follow Jesus. And you can meet him in the baptism waters. We're going to have a baptism service later next month, August 28th, up at the quarry. We'd love to have you be part of that. We've got a number of people who are going to be part of that baptism service. And if you would say, I want all there is of Jesus. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and to be like him and sharing in his death. Then come and be buried in the waters and be raised in new life again. And you have my personal invitation to be part of that. Catch Pastor Vaughn or fill out one of the cards or come up and talk to me. I'll be up front afterwards and we can talk about the next steps for that. Arthur Burns was the chairman of the Federal Reserve for a long time in Washington, D.C. And he was an advisor for Dwight Eisenhower and Ronald Reagan and a number of U.S. presidents and because of his long time of service and the, the presidents he served with, he had a pretty significant reputation, and he was Jewish. So a lot of people were surprised, and he began showing up, up at a prayer meeting of evangelicals when they would gather, I think, every week or every month for prayer and for Bible study. And he was the last person anybody expected to be there. But Arthur Burns began showing up, and there was kind of this unexpected or un, unspoken rule that nobody ever asked Arthur Burns to participate. Nobody quite knew where he stood with the Lord. Nobody knew quite what he was thinking or what his participation was. So they just let him come and sit there quietly and nobody ever bothered him or asked him to do anything. But one day there was a guest who came and this guest didn't know the unspoken rules and at the end of their gathering, he turned to Arthur Burns and asked him to close their time in prayer. 
And all the regulars kind of gasped because they didn't, this is not how we do things. Nobody asks Arthur Burns to pray. And yet Arthur Burns didn't miss a beat and he reached over and grabbed the hands of the people next to him and this is what he prayed. Lord, I pray that you would bring Jews to know Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would bring Muslims to know Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that you would bring Christians to know Jesus Christ. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I don't want to know some mirage about Christ. I don't want to know what other people tell me about Christ. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and so to be made like him in his death and to attain the the joy of suffering with him. I want to know Christ and may God answer that prayer, the Arthur Burns prayer in us. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we don't want to know what other people think about you. We want to know you. We don't want to know what your reputation is through other people. We want to know you firsthand. To know Christ, this unforgettable figure, the only begotten Son of God. morning, Lord, we recognize that there is an accumulation of debris that is cluttered for many of us around what we think about you and what we know about you. By your Holy Spirit, we pray that you would help us to pull back all the debris and the the rumors about you and help us to know you. I invite you to pray with me in your heart. Jesus, I want to know you with my whole heart. See you clearly. And walk in your steps. Jesus, be the center of all that we do. Jesus, be at the core of our lives. Help everything we do to be founded and based on your word, and based on your life. We pray this all. In Jesus' name, amen.